All right, let me uh, start one more time. Uh, our speaker, Stephanie aquavela rauch is a university professor of musicology at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. She is the chair of the Digital Music Research Interest Group in the German Society for Music Research and specializes in music editing, compositional processes, musics of the 18th through 20th centuries, as well as underrepresented musicians. She is the author of books on Arnold Schoenberg and on Forgotten Musicians, the editor or co-editor of books on digital music research, musical theater, and musical manuscript research, as well as the editor of numerous music editions. And she will speak to us today um, with, a, with a lecture on, or it is an introduction to music editions and the Music Encoding Initiative, MEI. So welcome, Professor Aquavela Rauch. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these kind words and also for the invite. I'm very happy that I'm able to, um, yeah, to talk to you um, tonight or actually around lunchtime, <laughs> uh, your time. And um, let me just uh, share my screen um, so we don't lose too much time here. Um, yeah, when Nico asked me if I uh, if I would do um, do this lecture, he he explicitly asked me to do an introduction um, um, to also um, I think to transport ideas um, into uh, the more public world. This, this uh, lecture is, is a public one. I I hope that uh, you will all be able. Um, to understand what I'm aiming to tell you. So please don't hesitate to ask questions um, afterwards, take notes, and um, I'll try to explain things um, in more detail if necessary. Um, <clears throat> well, um, musicology. Well, in musicology in general, we are interested in a great number of approaches of methods, topics um, that help us understand the role and function of music in society, as well as music by itself. Editions have always played an important role in the study of music since uh, providing scholars with the results of basic research and edited source material. As such, big editorial undertakings have played a vital role within the discipline. Currently, there are more than 19 long-term edition projects, plus dozens of smaller short-term projects in funding, either by the Academy of Sciences and Literature here in Mainz, um, which is a big funding board and funding institution in Germany, or by the German Research Association, uh, DFG. Um, and of course, I'm, this is just a very small insight into um, the general world of editions, but some of them, as you can see on the slide, are um, big, what we, I could call them big ships, because they are scholarly editions of, complete, um, of the complete works of um, major composers like Gluck, Haydn, Schubert, Brahms, Schoenberg, you can see them all. And <clears throat> some of them, as you can also see, have been going on for more than, for more than 40 years by now. So there is a lot of money that went into this sort of research. Um, interestingly enough, most of the long-term projects are non-digital editions because they were started decades ago. Before I'd like to introduce you to the world of digital music editions and the Music Encoding Initiative, I would like to talk a little bit about conce concepts of editions that played an important role for the development of critical music editions in general. What are editions? An edition, is the revealing reproduction of historical documents, um, not necessarily only of um, musical documents. I'm, I'm talking about editions in a, more, in a much wider sense. 
In this context, historical means a distance to be bridged between our present understanding and the need for explanation of historical reality. Documents is a generic term for physical objects that can be described and the texts that are communicated with them. Reproduction refers to the necessary criterion for the complete representation of the subject of the edition on a visual and or mostly textual level. Therefore, it is important to note that a description or a catalog are not yet an edition. Finally, revealing is a generic term for all critical operations from the selection of those objects to be edited to the external description. These are first the decisions um, that are inevitable um, even in a transcription. Second, the identifica identification of referenced, well, let's call them things in texts. And third, the historical factual annotations to the textual criticism in a narrower sense. And again, the person I've been quoting, Patrick Saale, emphasizes that a reproduction without criticism is not an addition. When addition as a field of academic interest developed roughly around 1800, two additional methods in particular emerged, one by Friedrich Heinrich von der Hagen and one by Karl Lachmann. In the text-oriented method by von der Hagen, the traditional context of a text is investigated. The editor then chooses the oldest and therefore or, uh, best uh, manuscript as the text basis for their edition. Uh, in brackets, this is of course all to be questioned. Um, the way more influential method for music editions is however the second one. Lachmann's author-oriented method, also called filiation, was based on restoring the text and intentions of one um, sort of almighty author or genius. <clears throat> this text is commonly referred to as the original text or archetype and uh, represents an ideal, invisible, complete and absolute work or opus that must and can be reconstructed. Lachmann therefore rejected the majority of the traditional texts as inferior products of amateur writers and did not take these additional <laughs> However, he developed the text critical method as a basis of standard philological procedures. And on the slide, you can um, you can see the steps that the editor um, normally performs. I, I won't go into too much detail, um, but um, you can see that they um, consist of finding the sources, compare them, analyze the differences between them, establish some sort of stemma or some, some sort of relationship between them, and then uh, evaluate uh, different readings and trying to figure out um, which is well, the, the best in this case. Okay. Hmm. Although the text critical method can still be seen as the strong basis of a high number of editions, there are other developments. Further on in the 20th century, both older approaches were developed further. Researchers focused on certain aspects of a text. And I'd like to introduce you to the two main directions. They're called critique générique and material philo philology. <clears throat> the first one, critique générique, focuses on the genesis of a text developed by scholars of French literature in the 1960s, the focus is to reconstruct the writing process rather than finding out more about an abstract or imaginary ideal status of the author's will or the opus. The aim is not to find or invent an original text form, 
scholars are rather interested in the processes of change during the creation of a text, the end point of which is not seen at the moment, for example, of printing a text. Material philology. Since the 1990s, material philology has focused on the materiality of sources. Originating in studies of medieval and early modern literature, the materiality of each source is taken into consideration in order to decipher the wider context of the text. And let me quote um, Kai Bremner and Uwe Wirth. The aim is within the framework of a theoretically and historically trained observation of the manuscript space to draw conclusions about the linguistic and cultural context from which these documents originate. The manuscripts thus become indications of, of certain cultural influences and phenomena. Another direction, which I hadn't put on the, on the um, slides before, is something called new philology. Um, it's a, it, it was a new direction that was formed out of the latter two um, around the 1990s. New philology criticizes the traditional methods of correcting and reconstructing texts that are then called originals. Hence, you will find no normalization of orthography, grammar, or abbreviations. And uh, since various versions of a text are considered in an edition, the object of an edition uh, by itself is altered. This shifts the focus once more away from the author towards a cultural historical classification of the various text witnesses. This approach also combines elements of the aforementioned methods. And a very uh, prominent um, scholar is, is, I think, Gumbrecht, who also teaches in the States. <clears throat> so you might have asked yourself, and what does that actually have to do with music? Why is she telling us all this? Well, let's, let's um, come to... Um, the core of what I'm, I'm, I want to tell you. Um, what are music editions? Well, let's put it this way. Music editions are editions of historical documents that have a musical reference in the broadest sense. This includes musical sources as well as, as other sources. Um, verbal ones, for example, like letters or uh, newspaper clippings, account books, etc., but also contextual uh, sources uh, like photographs, for example. <clears throat> Since music editions are as well addressed um, to scholars as to the practical music world, there is a wide variety of editions used in um, in let's call it the musical world, not just in musicology. The first two and probably number four on the list can be, it can be compared to the types of edition you find in other disciplines like history or literature studies. The other types of editions can only be found in the broad field of music. Um, for example, um, the general practical edition or the instructive edition that uh, tells you how to actually perform the music by adding a lot of further information. To create a scholarly or historical critical edition of music, traditionally, <clears throat> the basic elements of the text critical method are used and transformed, uh, no, transferred to form the basis of music philology. And let's have a, a closer look at the definition of one of the um, one of the few scholars that actually published books on music philology. <coughs> Excuse me, Georg um, Fieder. He says um, music philology um, seeks to comply with the wishes of past composers. Um, the discipline wants to restore the original musical text and elucidate it. Uh, with as adequate an understanding as possible. 
For this purpose, music philology consults um, the original sources and with the highest exactitude, pedantically according to its detractors, takes great pains over minute details. Um, he goes on and he says that correspondingly in music, we have as a core the primary studies of sources and notation, which are encircled by textual criticism, followed by the theoretical interpretation of text and work. The next string is formed by music theory as the historical musical grammar and as a musical dictionary of the language of music, both in the stylistic sense of a systematic inventory of musical paradigms, as well as in the musical theoretical sense of a dictionary of musical terms. The investigation of musical language connects directly to the study of musical repertoire, the history of composition, and <clears throat> the generic and stylistic history of music, all pure synthesis um, which result from the criticism and hermeneutics of individual comp uh, compositions and theoretical texts about music. So now we all know a little more about at least the theory behind music philology and music philology is seen as the basis of any sort of work um, on musical editions. <clears throat> Discussions of the concept of a work or an opus like a new musicology led to a, a division between music editions. Older editions appear to be less critical in the sense that they are aiming for one final version. Newer editions follow more open concepts and more possible versions. Among those, we find editions based on sources reflecting an identical version. For example, looking at different stage productions of the same opera. Um, there's a very uh, fascinating project um, that was, uh, I think, located in Berlin. Um, it is Operas of Sati the uh, Italian composer Sati. Um, you can Google it. I think um, just uh, type in edition uh, Sati opera and I, I think you will find it. And you might like to have a look at it. They, they try to figure out what was changed from production to production by editing the same opera um, three or four times. And they are actually, um, they, they also managed to have that performed, which was quite interesting too. Okay, we can also find editions of one version as it is reflected in one source that is widely contextualized and also presents the documentation of other versions. <clears throat> <clears throat> so far, I've talked about various edition, edition concepts and methods in general, plus a little bit about musicological approaches. Before I'll actually show you solutions for digital music editions, I would like to talk, uh, to take you on a little detour. On your screen, you see some thoughts on how digitality and musicology interact. Most of this, uh, must seem logical or familiar to you. It's not just in musicology that we use digital ways of communication or administration. It is, of course, not just in musicology that we use research methods that are now digitally based. And of course, it is not just in musicology that we use digital forms of publications. <clears throat> However, it is only in musicology that scholarly editions also play, can play a vital role in cultural life. The world of music editions and the world of music performances have uh, been closely related and intertwined for centuries. Therefore, taking aspects of practicability and usability into consideration has always been a very important aspect for creating music editions. Furthermore, 
this has also been extremely relevant in first thoughts about digital approaches. So I would, I'm emphasizing this because um, in uh, the world of normal uh, text editions, um, for example, in um, literature studies, um, we have editions that are only there for scholarly, for scholarly purposes. However, in musicology, there's very few projects like that, that only have this emphasis. Um, on the contrary, um, most projects try to enable performers to use um, the musical text created in the editions. <clears throat> in the field of music in particular, it is often easier and above all clearer to present uh, a situation in musical notation um, than to work with verbal descriptions, even more if there are several possible interpretations of handwritten music texts. It is much easier for the user of an edition to understand what the editor says if they can see all relevant source facsimiles in appropriate quality at the same time. <clears throat> and this thought became one of the basic ideas, not just um, of Franz Biering's multidimensional editorial model that you can see here, that um, he developed, I think, in the 90s and presented, for example, in 2006 in London. Um, but it was also um, the basis for um, current standard software solutions for digital music editions like the um, EDIROM, which was developed uh, in Detmold in Germany. <clears throat> but let's go back one step. What actually is a digital music edition? First of all, um, a musical edition um, does not become digital simply because it is offered in a digital medium. Pure ret uh, retro digitization does not go beyond subsequently added simple search options. And that does not actually represent digital editions in, 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 in a real sense. It's merely digitized content from another medium. Conversely, this means that digital editions are primarily characterized by a consistent and completely media-friendly implementation. Born digital editions show some of the key characteristics of digital media. For example, through their affinity for image-based content and hypertextuality. Contents are no longer designed and processed um, sequentially, but open up individual access routes for the user through a network-like structure. It is no longer the order of the contents planned by the editor that determines the knowledge process of the user, but rather his own interest, as Jerome McGann has already discussed in 1995. And he discussed it because all before all these um, modern um, possibilities could have even been imagined. The lack of clarity and historical changeability of musical notation resulted in the lack, uh, no, sorry, resulted in the idea of providing the user with more extensive reading support than what could be found in printed editions. Furthermore, the use of new media allows <coughs> um, more, um, furthermore, the use of new media allows um, editorial decisions to uh, be shown in the most transparent way possible. The, so let's have a closer look at these two editions. First, the Richard the digital editions. The best example for that is the Neue Mozart Ausgabe, which you can see here. <coughs> and I'm sorry, I have to and take a sip of water. Okay, um, and as you can see here and here, 
they basically scanned the books and the printed editions, which is great. Now we have them, we can look at them online, but it is only that it's a, it's a scanned book and it can only be used as scanned books. <clears throat> Born digital editions, um, on the other hand, can do much more. They can present a fixed text and various interpretations of the sources, and they can include other media. They can be made using the same traditional methods that I explained earlier on. And they can do much more, um, like conveniently pre present visual and other material. But you can um, also semanticize every content for the computer, meaning you can make all the content machine readable. That means, for example, that you can directly link music notation with the editorial notes. So you can see directly what the editor changed in the music and the, in the, in the new edition of the musical text. Um, you can also um, check, for example, in the source material. You have way more possibilities of contextualizing um, all the sources that you use and of contextualizing um, the decisions that were made. <clears throat> um, I'd like to give you a quick uh, um, example. Um, here, um, I know it, it, it seems to be so much on one screen, but um, as you can see, um, these are the options you get from a digital edition. This is just a, a little um, showpiece of um, um, my, my digital edition of the operetta Der Vogelhändler. And what, what I would like to emphasize on, you can all see my, um, my, my cursor. So you can see this is the new musical text. And you can see here are the measures and you can see little dots um, in, in the real edition, you can click on the dots and then windows open. For example, here with um, uh, comments and you can see what the editor did um, as a comment. If you don't trust the editor, you see the sources, the decisions are based on and you can click on the sources. For example, here is source A you can click on it and then it enlarges and you can go directly into the source and you can check yourself. And if you don't like the decision, okay, you take a note and you, uh, when you, for example, you wanna perform the piece, you change it back. You change it to something else because your reading of the source is a different one. <clears throat> you can also um, um, use navigation um, possibilities that are, a more dimensional than just a table of content in a book. You can decide to always have a source open in the background because you know you always go back and forth between them. You can also um, open uh, additional texts that were written by the scholar to um, give you an insight into the edition itself and into the decisions, into the background. This is what I meant when I earlier on talked about contextualization. And as you probably can see, there's black text and there's blue text. And it's just like online in the internet. Um, if you click on the blue, um, it's a link. Everything is hypertextually connected. Um, you can either uh, open other texts, other word texts that give you more explanations or <clears throat> sometimes you're being brought to a source or um, to a certain measure in the music. All this is possible with digital editions. I am, uh, there's a, I just, uh, I did a few um, errors in there to show you the connections between the parts that I just explained with using my cursor. Okay. Um, another example is um, you can focus on whatever topic you can think of if you are the editor. 
For example, um, what I try to show you here is that um, the author of the music, the operetta has uh, three authors, um, one for the music and two for the text, but the author of the music um, crossed out a word here and wrote it above it in a new way. This is a dialectal version of the German word for you. And um, in this region, in um, Tyrol, in Austria, um, there's a certain way of speaking, pronouncing this word. And if this is taught to the singers on stage, um, the stage production becomes um, more credible. So you can decide you want to ignore this, or you can, for example, read up on uh, local colors and dialectal markers that are um, being, uh, that can be traced in the operetta. And um, if you're uh, a scholar, you might, you might be interested in uh, connecting with uh, literature, uh, scholars or linguists to talk about this. If you're a performer, you might be just you might might be interested in how is it pronounced correctly on stage to make it a better performance. All these are possibilities of digital editions. And again, my I'm sorry for that. <clears throat> Born digital editions expand information technologies. On, <clears throat> on which music editing work is based. The editor's uh, decisions also include which information is directly connected to the source, um, source text. Um, new ways of digital publications go along with new uses for performances. And I just showed you some but you can also imagine perform performers using iPads and just having direct access to um, new editions without having to wait for printed editions that might not fit on the, um, into the bag or um, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> Text and code helps, Stone code helps to communicate additional information to the computer. Mm. For example, um, to teach the computer semantic um, categories. Um, text and code helps to keep data available for a long time. Text and code helps to make text independent from platforms or software solutions. And text and code helps to enable and guarantee flexible data exchange. <clears throat> so the real um, born digital approaches um, want to um, develop ways of um, teaching the computer the real meanings behind the music. Um, and the way it is done is through code and there are certain technical standards, um, special XML languages. XML you might be familiar with because of um, um, yeah, the, the internet languages. It's basically a form that is called extensible markup languages and there's um, especially two that are used in um, editions because they were especially developed for scholarly editions. And that is the text encoding initiative, TEI, or the music encoding initiative, MEI. Um, let's have a closer look on both of them um, because I'd like to um, enable you to understand the, the, the real core of digital editions a little better. The text encoding initiative is a, um, well, it's, it's a markup language for editions, but it is really a consortium for the joint development and maintenance of a standard for digital representation of texts. 
water sentence. So it means it's a basically um, a community <clears throat> and their goal is to develop and maintain um, this coding language for editions. It's a, it's a worldwide network and it was developed especially for the humanities and for cultural studies um, by scholars coming from that field, also from the libraries. <clears throat> by now, over the last, um, well, let's say two, three, two and two or three decades, it became the standard for digital preparation and processing of texts. Um, how does that work? Um, it works through tagging. Tagging means you put um, little brackets around words and you, def you tell basically tell the computer um, what category this word belongs to. So each tag carries information and this information can be, for example, a name, a place, a title, etc. cetera. Um, it, and these tags show the computer <clears throat> um, what meaning is actually hidden in the text. And it is the job of editors to add this information to the transcription. Here you can see um, an example for that. Uh, it's taken from a hybrid edition of the Circle of Songs written by court composer Carl-Louis Baguer from Detmold. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's written for voice, piano, and violin. Um, in the edition, you can choose what, what you would like to read, the edition layout or the XML layout. And um, this is, was quite handy, so I decided to show this to you. So as you can see, um, you can, for example, um, tell the computer um, how the layout is. That is pretty standard if you're familiar with how to do a website, how to, how to program a website. But you can also, um, for example, um, put a note in, um, like here, for example, um, a person with the abbreviation JV being Joachim Veit um, says that um, this stanza refers to um, a part of the new, a new version of these songs in the third stanza. So this is an editorial remark that here you can see um, is, uh, is, is kind of put in, in a gray background. It's a comment so you can understand um, it to, so you get a little bit of contextual information. Okay, mm, think, uh, I think the principle should be clear. So let's have a look at the music encoding initiative. Um, it is like um, TEI, an open source effort to create a system for representation of musical documents in a machine readable structure. So basically it's a markup language for um, musical text and it is, what, uh, it is nowadays widely used for editions, but not only, but that is the main focus of it. <clears throat> it was developed especially um, um, for the humanities and for cultural studies um, that deal with musical text. Um, interestingly enough, it's not just for, for pure Western music notation, although this is the core of it, but there's approaches um, with a big um, um, project that focuses on Ottoman, Ottomanian music. Um, if you're interested on that, I can, I can send you the link to an article how NEI is used there. Um, the uh, music encoding initiative basically tells the computer what the various signs of musical notations are. Um, another function is that, uh, I, will, I would like to show you in a second. Okay, this is what it looks like. I, I chose a little example 
from the Verovio page. Um, uh, it's Silent Night, and this is how it would be transcribed. But I'd like to focus on the various parts such a code can have. Um, the first part is always something called the header. The header um, holds so-called me metadata, that is um, information about information, data about data. So for example, um, here you can see in the background that there is um, there's a tag that has something, uh, it's, it's an abbreviation for pu public statement. And we learn through this <clears throat> that a person named Klaus Rettinghaus encoded this music on January 17th, 2017, and that it was published on GitHub <clears throat> um, in this, this is the address of the page. Um, in uh, its uh, GitHub is an open source repository, basically. So um, now we know way more about how this music uh, got into the computer and who made the decisions, which is something if you just saw the music by itself, you wouldn't see it um, unless you incorporated it and the code just asks, asks you to do it. So this is the first part of um, a scholarly um, code. Um, this is the act actual music code. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's just another part of uh, the code of these few bars of, 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 of Silent Night. Um, encoding mainly the first first measure. So you can see encoding music takes up a lot of code space, uh, which doesn't really matter because as a coder, you, you never write out everything just um, it, by itself. There's programs which help you and they, they add information. Like you, for example, you never have to close a tag. This is, this is called closing a tag. Um, with a certain um, shortcut, the computer just does it for you. But what you can see is how, and that's why I chose uh, why I chose this example. You can see how MEI works. So basically, um, you can see that the structure behind it is that you tell the computer, for example, the key signature and the time signature. Um, six, eight bar. Um, um, and then you can see, um, for example, how each node is coded. Um, each node is characterized through its octave, its duration, and its stem direction, and the words connected to it. So here you have <clears throat> the duration of an eighth node the, uh, for, in the fourth octave. <clears throat> There's um, um, there is, hang on, where is it? Here's the stem direction, which is up. So this is how the music here is taught to the computer, um, maybe to make it a little easier to understand. Um, <clears throat> on the slide before, I think um, in the corner, you can see the word Verovio. Um, um, that this is where I got the example from. <clears throat> Verovio is quite a cool tool uh, because it enables you to create this music notation from the code. Um, until recently, you always had to um, put the music into the computer, into like uh, Sibelius, for example, and then you could create the code. But once you're in the code, you can't go back. You, to visualize the music and traditional notation. And Verovio is a tool that enables you to do that. And that is quite cool because that enables you to communicate your code directly to users that aren't familiar um, reading a code. So, <clears throat> okay. As you can imagine, once music is, well, I, I, I keep saying is taught to the computer, what it means, like once the computer has learned what the meaning behind the signs is, 
um, it is possible to come up with other operations. For an advanced example, I invite you to Google um, the project Beethoven's Workshop. Uh, this is the address, you can also just copy it and have a look around. Um, it's, it's explained quite well. And this is um, using the music encoding initiative to understand um, Beethoven's creational process. Um, it's a long-term project that runs, I think, 18 years, and they are developing new tools, um, new MEI tools to present music and certain music operations. And this um, brings me to the end of my little lecture. Working on digital music editions helps aiming for greater transparency and more in-depth information. Um, XML-based coding through, um, well, I, I'd like to call them edition languages. It's, it's not quite adequate, but it, it helps understanding what the music encoding initiative and the text encoding initiative are. Um, so XML-based coding makes operations machine re uh, readable and widens existing possibilities. This makes it open to be combined with other media. Furthermore, it can be easily accessed via open access and open source. And uh, therefore we can, uh, the scholarly world can connect way better and work um, together in a, a much better way than before. Well, and hopefully, and finally, actually, this is, I think, why we are all doing it. Um, all this hopefully helps us um, to get a wider insight into history and into historical contexts behind the texts that we edit and through editing these texts. If you're interested in um, knowing more about my sources, there's a selected bi bibliography. I, I think we, um, we present, we, we can upload the, um, the slides somewhere if, if you're interested, or I can send them to you. If, you. if you contact me, I can post it in the chat or something. This is what I um, used. And I can just uh, finish up and say thank you very much for listening to me and for being here tonight. And I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about what I just presented to you. And I'm very happy to um, yeah, listen to your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this wonderful lecture. So yeah, please do use the applause function if you like um, uh, to give some applause. Um, I will now, in, in a second, I will switch off the recording uh so that you don't have to feel oh i'm uh, i don't want to be recorded asking my question i will switch off the recording and then we have time for discussion so let me do that